It is not generally known. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason Mills. Charles Dickens' 200th Anniversary Collection, Volume 4. It is not generally known by Charles Dickens. All newspaper readers are probably on familiar terms with this phrase. It is not generally known that Her Majesty's screw line of battle ship Hogarth 120 was precisely seven years, seven months, seven days, seven hours, and seven minutes on the stocks in Portsmouth Yard. It is not generally known that there is now in the garden of Mr. Pips of Camberwell a gooseberry weighing upwards of three ounces, the growth of a tree which Mr. Pips has reared entirely on warm toast and water. It is not generally known that on the last rent day of the estates of the Earl of Boozel of Castle Boozel, his lordship remitted to his tenants five per cent on all the amounts then paid up, and afterwards regaled them on the good old English cheer of roast beef and humming ale. It is not generally known that ale in this connection always hums. It is not generally known that a testimonial in the form of a magnificent silver centrepiece and candelabra, weighing five hundred ounces, was on Tuesday last presented to Cockadoodle Esquire, F.S.A., at a splendid banquet given him by a brilliant circle of his friends and admirers, in testimony no less of their admiration of his qualities as a man than of anything else you like to fill up the blank with. It is not generally known that when Admiral Sir Charles Napier was junior post-captain on the African station, looking out for slavers, his ship was one day boarded by a strange craft, in the stern sheets of which sat a genuine specimen of the true British seaman, who, as he dropped alongside, exclaimed in the voice of a stentor, A vast heaving! Old Charlie, ahoy! Upon this the Admiral, then post-captain, who chanced at the moment to be pacing the quarter-deck with his telescope at his eye, which it is not generally known he never removes, except at meals or when asleep, looked good-humouredly over the starboard bulwarks, and responded, waving his cocked hat, Tom Gaff, ahoy! And I am glad to see you, my lad! They had never met since the year 1814, but Tom Gaff, like a true foxhole salt, had never forgotten his old rough and tough first luff, as he characteristically called him, and had now come from another part of the station on leave of absence two hundred and fifty miles in an open boat, expressly to get a glimpse of his former officer, of whose brilliant career he was justly proud. It is needless to add that all hands were piped to grog, and that Tom and Charlie were mutually pleased, but it is not generally known that they exchanged tobacco boxes, and that if when old Charlie hoisted his broad pennant in proud command of the Baltic fleet, his gallant heart beat higher than usual, it pressed, as if for sympathy, against Tom Gaff's tobacco box, to which his left-hand waistcoat pocket is on all occasions devoted. Similarly, many other choice events, chiefly reserved for the special London correspondence of country newspapers, are not generally known, including gifts of various ten-pound notes by Her Gracious Majesty when a child to various old women, and the constant sending of innumerable loyal presents, principally cats and cheeses, to Buckingham Palace. One thing is sure to happen. Codgers becomes a celebrated public character, or a great capitalist. Then it is not generally known that in the year 1800 and blank there stood one summer evening on an old London bridge a wayworn boy eating a penny loaf and eyeing the passengers wistfully, whom Mr. Flam of the Minories, attracted by something unusual in the boy's appearance, was induced to bestow sixpence on, and to invite to dinner every Sunday at one o'clock for seven years. This boy was Codgers and it is not generally known that the tradition is still preserved with pride in Mr. Flam's family. Now it appears to me that several small circumstances of a different kind have lately happened, or are yet happening about us, which can hardly be generally known, or, if known, generally appreciated. And as this is vacation time, when most of us have some leisure for gossiping, I will enumerate a few. It is not generally known that in this present year 1854, the English people of the middle classes are a mob of drunkards, more beastly than the Russian courtiers under Peter the Great. It is not generally known that this is the national character. It is not generally known that a multitude of our countrymen, taken at random from the sense, industry, self-denial, self-respect, and household virtues of this nation, repairing to the exhibition at Sydenham, make it their business to get drunk there immediately, to struggle and fight with one another, to tear one another's clothes off, and to smash and throw down the statues, I say this is not generally known to be so, yet I find this picture, in a fit of temperate enthusiasm, 
presented to the people by an artist, who is one of themselves, in pages addressed to themselves. I am even informed by a temperate journal that the artist saw these facts in this said exhibition at Sydenham with his own bodily eyes. Well, I repeat, that this is a state of things not generally known. It is not generally known, I believe, that the two scarcest books in England are The Pilgrim's Progress and The Vicar of Wakefield. Yet I find that the present American minister, perfectly familiar with England, communicated the surprising intelligence to a company assembled not long ago at Fishmonger's Hall. It is not generally known, perhaps, that in expatiating on the education of his countrymen, His Excellency remarked of these two rare works, that while they were to be met with in every cabin in the United States, they were comparatively little known in England. Not generally known, that is to say. It is not generally known, and if it were recorded of our English institutions, say, by a French writer, would not, I think, be generally believed, that there is any court of justice in England in which an individual gravely concerned in the case under inquiry can twice call the advocate opposed to him a ruffian in open court, under the judge's nose and within the judge's hearing. Is it generally known that such a case occurred this last July, and was nobody's business? It is not generally known that the people have nothing to do with a certain large club which assembles at Westminster, and that the club has nothing to do with them. It is simply an odd anomaly that the members of the club happen to be elected by a body who don't belong to the club at all, the pleasure and business of the club being not with that body, but with what its own members say and do. Look to the reports of the club's proceedings. In January, the right hand says it is the left hand that has abetted the slanders on an illustrious personage, and the left hand says it is the right hand. In February, Mr. Pott comes down on Mr. Kettle, and Mr. Kettle requests to be taken from his cradle and followed by inches to that honourable hob. In the same month, the forefinger of the left hand hooks itself on with mosaic Arabian pertinacity to the two forefingers of the right hand, and never lets go any more. In March, the most delightful excitement of the whole session is about a club dinner party. In April, there is Easter. In May, there is infinite club joy over personal mosaic Arabia and personal admiralty. In June, A relieves himself of the mild suggestion that B is an extraordinary bold apostate, when in cuts C, who has nothing to do with it, and the whole alphabet fall together by the ears. In August, Home Office takes up his colleague under Treasury, for talking sheer nonsense. In the same month, prorogation. Through the whole time, one perpetual clatter of, What did I say? What did you say? What did he say? Yes, I will. No, you won't. Yes, I did. No, you didn't. Yes, I shall. No, you shan't. And no such thing as what do they say, those few people outside there, ever heard of. It is not generally known, perhaps, to what lengths, in these times, the pursuit of an object, and a cheer or a laugh, will carry a member of this club I am speaking of. It cannot have been generally observed, as it appears to me, for I have met with no just indignation on the subject, how far one of its members was thus carried a very little while ago. Here is the case. A board is to be got rid of. I oppose this board. I have long opposed it. It is possible that my official opposition may have very considerably increased its difficulties and crippled its efficiency. I am bent upon a jocose speech and a pleasant effect. I stand up in the heart of the metropolis of the world. From every quarter of the world, a dreadful disease, which is peculiarly the scourge of the many, because the many are the poor, ill-fed and badly housed, whereas I, being of the few, am neither, is closing in around me. It is coming from my low, nameless countrymen, the rank and file at Varna. It is coming from the hot sands of India, and the cold waters of Russia. It is in France. It is in Naples. It is in the stifling Vicoli of Genoa, where I read accounts of the suffering people that should make my heart compassionate, if anything in this world can. Nay, it has begun to strike down many victims in this city where I speak, as I, the speaker, cannot fail to know, must know, am bound to know, do know thoroughly well. But I want a point. I have it. The cholera is always coming when the powers of this board are about to expire. A laugh. This well-timed joke of mine, so neatly made upon the greatest misery and direst calamity that human nature can endure, will be repeated tomorrow in the same newspaper which will carry to my honourable friends here, through electric telegraph, the tidings of a troop ship put back to Plymouth with this very pestilence on board. What are all such trifles to me? I wanted a laugh. I have got a laugh. Talk to me of the agony and death of men and brothers. 
am i not a lord and a member now is it generally known i wonder that this indecency happened have the people of such a place as totness chanced to hear of it or will they ever hear of it and shall we ever hear of their having heard of it it is not generally known that an entirely new principle has begun to obtain in legislation and is gaining wider and broader recognition every day i allude to the profoundly wise principle of legislating with a constant reference and deference to the worst members of society and almost excluding from consideration the comfort and convenience of the best the question what do the decent mechanic and his family want or deserve always yields under this enlightened pressure to the question what will the vagabond idler drunkard or jailbird turn to bad account as if there were anything in the wide world which the dregs of humanity will turn to good account and as if the shadow of the convict ship and newgate drop had any business in the plainest sense or justice to be cast from january to december on honest hard-working steady job smith's family fireside yet job smith suffers heavily at every turn of his life and at every inch of its straight course too from the determined ruffianism in which he has no more part than he has in the blood royal six days of job's week are days of hard monotonous exhausting work upon the seventh job thinks that he his old woman and the children could find it in their hearts to walk in a garden if they might or to look at a picture or a plant or a beast of the forest or even a colossal toy made in imitation of some of the wonders of the world most people would be apt to think job reasonable in this but up starts britannia tearing her hair and crying never never here is sloggins with the broken nose the black eye and the bulldog what job smith uses sloggins will abuse therefore job smith must not use so job sits down again in a killing atmosphere a little weary and out of humour or leans against a post all sunday long it is not generally known that this accursed sloggins is the evil genius of job's life job never had in his possession at any one time a little cask of beer or a bottle of spirits what he and his family drink in that way is fetched in very small portions indeed from the public house however difficult the westminster club gentleman may find it to realize such an existence job has realized it through many a long year and he knows infinitely better than the whole club can tell him at what hour he wants his drop of beer and how it best suits his means and convenience to get it against which practical conviction of job's britannia tearing her hair again shrieks tenderly sloggins sloggins with the broken nose the black eye and the bulldog will go to ruin as if he were ever going anywhere else if job smith has his beer when he wants it so job gets it when britannia thinks it good for sloggins to let him have it and marvels greatly but perhaps he marvels most when being invited in immense type to go and hear the evangelist of eloquence or the apostle of purity i have noticed in such invitations rather lofty not to say audacious titles he strays in at an open door and finds a personage on a stage crying aloud to him behold me i too am sloggins i likewise had a broken nose a black eye and a bulldog survey me well straight is my nose white is my eye deceased is my bulldog i formerly sloggins now evangelist or apostle as the case may be cry aloud in the wilderness unto you job smith that in respect that i was formerly sloggins and am now saintly therefore you job smith who were never sloggins or in the least like him shall by force of law accept what i accept deny what i deny take upon yourself my shape and follow me now it is not generally known that poor job though blessed with an average understanding and thinking any putting out of the way of that ubiquitous sloggins a meritorious action highly to be commended never can understand the application of all this to himself who never had anything in common with sloggins but always abominated and abjured him it is not generally known that job smith is fond of music but he is he has a decided natural liking for it the italian opera being rather dear sloggins would disturb the performance if he were let in cheap job's taste is not highly cultivated still music pleases him and softens him and he takes such recreation in the way of hearing it as his small means can buy job is fond of a play also he is not without the universal taste implanted in the child and the savage and surviving in the educated mind and a representation by men and women of the joys and sorrows crimes and virtues sufferings and triumphs of this mortal life has a strong charm for him job is not much of a dancer but he likes well enough to see dancing and his eldest boy is up to it and he himself can shake a leg in a good plain figure on occasion 
For all these reasons, Job now and then, in his rare holidays, is to be found at a cheap concert, a cheap theatre, or a cheap dance, and here one might suppose he would be left in peace to take his money's worth if he can find it. It is not generally known, however, that against these poor amusements an army rises periodically, and terrifies the inoffensive Job to death. It is not generally known why. On account of sloggins. Five and twenty prison chaplains, good men and true, have each got sloggins hard and fast and converted him. Sloggins, in five and twenty solitary cells at once, has told the five and twenty chaplains all about it. Child of evil as he is, with every drop of blood in his body circulating lies all through him, night and day these five and twenty years Sloggins is nevertheless become the embodied spirit of truth. Sloggins has declared, That amusement's done it! Sloggins has made manifest that Harmony brought him to it. Sloggins has asserted that The Dreamer set him a-knocking his old mother's head again the wall. Sloggins has made manifest that it was the double shuffle what kept him out of church. Sloggins has written the declaration. Dear sir, if I hadn't seen the opera Fraudaviria, I shouldn't, dear sir, have been over aggravated into the folly of beating Betsy with a red-hot poker. Sloggins warmly recommends that all theatres be shut up for good, all dancing rooms pulled down, and all music stopped. Considers that nothing else is people's ruin. Is certain that but for Sitch, he would now be in a large way of business, and universally respected. Consequently, all the five-and-twenty, in five-and-twenty honest and sincere reports, do severally urge that the requirements and deservings of Job Smith be in no wise considered or cared for, that the natural and deeply rooted cravings of mankind be plucked up and trodden out, that Sloggins' gospel be the gospel for the conscientious and industrious part of the world, that Sloggins rule the land and rule the waves, and that Britons unto Sloggins ever, ever, ever shall be slaves. I submit that this great and dangerous mistake cannot be too generally known, or generally thought about. End of It Is Not Generally Known Recording by Jason Mills End of Charles Dickens' 200th Anniversary Collection, Volume 4